My definition of addiction is something that you can't stop, right? And most people who struggle from addictions are trying to regulate and alter their internal state. Now, you and I have been hypnotized and conditioned into believing that change happens outside of us. People are looking for something outside of them to change their internal state. It's kind of a Newtonian principle. You wait for your wealth to come to feel abundant. You wait for your healing to occur to feel wholeness. You wait for your success to show up so you feel empowered. You wait for your new relationship to show up to feel love. You're, you're waiting for the event outside of you to happen, to change how you feel inside of you. That's cause and effect. And we're conditioned based on consumerism and marketing and programming that that's the way it works. To, to, to get something to relieve yourself. And, uh, and the problem with that is that people begin to confuse true happiness with pleasure and they're not the same thing so people who have addictions like that typically have had uh, some very difficult past experiences that have branded them emotionally and they just don't know how to change they just don't know and they're just looking for some relief inside of them so that they can make that feeling go away so we can become distracted by our external environment for a period of time, you know. But then when you, you, you realize that the sports car or the, the new wardrobe or the vacation or the whatever people do to try to make the feeling go, and the novelty of that, that, that thing outside of us wears off because we're trying to re-identify with our environment, and that goes away. The next thing that people do is they look for some immediate change. And so they take a drug. They drink something, they, they gamble, they watch pornography, and the event outside of them changes their internal chemistry. And the moment they notice that the pain or the emptiness goes away, the moment they feel differently, they look to see what caused it. And this is when the attachment begins. Here's the problem though. The rush of chemical change that takes place, the pleasure centers in the brain, there's a huge release of the pleasure chemicals and the, the release, the intensity of those release of those chemicals begins to desensitize the receptor sites in the brain. So as the brain chemicals uh, uh, are re released and the receptor sites become desensitized, the next time you gamble, the next time you take the drug, the next time you shop, you need a little bit more the next time. So then what happens is the pleasure centers start to get re recalibrated to a higher and higher level. So you're always going to need more to make that feeling go away. Sounds like an addiction to me. And so people get lost because then without the dependency on that external substance, the body which has become the mind is, is craving its relief. And so an addiction really is when the body is the mind. So you may say with your conscious mind, I want to give up drinking, I want to give up pornography, I want to give up gaming, I want to give up over shopping, I want to give it up consciously. But the body has been conditioned from the past subconsciously. And so now the body's the mind. Now, no one's told people that true change can happen within them. And so then, when people start to realize that there's a gap between the external world and how they present themselves to the world and their, their attention on the outer world and their attention on their inner world and how they really feel. And if they're spending the majority of their time looking outside of them for change and they don't want to look at this feeling, all they want to do is make that feeling go away, they're going to wind up in trouble. So true change is when you start looking within and you become conscious of your unconscious thoughts. In neuroscience it's called metacognition. You become aware of your habits and your unconscious behaviors. And you look at those emotions that are connected to past experiences and allow yourself to observe them. So then think about this. If 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old are those programmed states, the moment you're observing how you think, how you act, and how you feel, it means you're no longer the program. You're now a consciousness observing the program and you're beginning to objectify your subjective self. You are seeing yourself through the eyes of someone else. 
Turns out that the size of the frontal lobe, the crowning achievement of the human being, 40% of our entire brain, that's what separates us from all other species. It's the boss, it's the CEO, it's the conscience, it's the creative center. It's what speculates possibilities, it's what learns from its mistakes, it's what has intention, attention, it regulates and controls behaviors and emotional reactions. When your forebrain begins to turn on, when that begins to happen, you are now beginning to become the executive in your life. You're starting to gain more control over your life. If you're living primarily for the body-mind, then the hindbrain is looking for some chemical relief. So by the mere fact that you can begin to observe who you're being, means you can modify who you are to do a better job in life. It's difficult because we're breaking out of a biological mold. It's difficult because most people don't know that they have within their reach all the tools to do it. I can tell you that there is a strong majority of people who are still taking the placebo, who are still making their changes. Because we know that, like in a Parkinson's study, you give Parkinson's patients a placebo and more than 50% of them, their, their intention tremors go away. But if you take those people after they're making 200 times the amount of dopamine by getting a saline injection or an injection of distilled water, they're making their own dopamine. And Parkinson's is a deficiency in dopamine. When they return back to their life, and they see their caregiver and they play chess with their friends and they see their wife or sleep in the same bed or whatever it is. Their personal reality is creating their personality, reminding them who they are. Their disease comes back because they're back to the same identity. So like we know that... they out of drug rehab and going right back into their environment. Exactly. And that's how strong the environment is. So our <clears throat> students who continue to do the work are still getting, sustaining and producing more changes. Now, that's the majority of our students because our students are committed. But we do have students that don't make it. Why? Because this is a, this, we're doing something that is unknown. We're doing something. Not everybody is going to make that. Like, not everybody is going to finish the mile. Not everybody is going to make the journey to the top of the mountain. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a journey. And so we ask people then, uh, the ones that have had chronic diseases or conditions, the majority of them, by the way, are still doing exceptionally well. Some of them have had a, 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 a disease return. And what we have them do is measure. Every three months or six months, you measure. Why? Because this is not about denial. This is about knowing. So the people who have had some conditions return, we ask them to measure, and then we ask them to go at it again. And if their values aren't changing, we ask them to intervene with other medical means or whatever they need to, to improve. So the ones that have had the healings though, the majority of them are still doing exceptionally well. Some of them that stop taking the placebo or get start, they lose their job, they lose their mother, they lose their life and they get stressed and they, they go back to their old self. Well, it's a matter of time when we're gonna start seeing some of those conditions return.